Hi guys, this is Ableton Bible, and in this first video we're going to cover bass monitoring. The reason this is important is because there's absolutely no point getting into the composition and production phases if you can't hear what you're doing properly. It's absolutely imperative that you're monitoring correctly, especially if you're at home in your home studio that's not treated properly, then what you're hearing isn't going to be a true representation of what actually is going on in the software, so when you take your mix out to the clubs, you're going to hear there's all sorts of problems with the low end. So to that end, whilst it's not exactly the funnest topic, we're going to spend this session taking a look at how we can sort out the problems within our room, sort out any room modes, and make sure we're getting the most out of our speakers and a true representation of the mix, as well as how we can treat our room acoustically with bass traps and acoustic panels, and also we'll take a look at how we can set up our listening levels so we don't get an unbiased opinion from the Fletcher Munson curves. And then finally we'll take a quick look at reference tracks and how we can use a few techniques to try and get as much information from these reference tracks as we can. So the first point I need to mention is that when we're talking about bass, this can also include the kick drum as a low end or as a bass instrument. So we need to think of the bass a bit more like a frequency range as opposed to just a specific bass instrument like a bass guitar. So when we look at it from a frequency range perspective, we've got 40 hertz up to 80 hertz, that's one octave, that's the sub octave, and then we've got 80 hertz up to about 250 which is an octave and a half and that's our bass range. So we can look at that as our low end spectrum. So ideally when we're working on a track we want to be monitoring our bass through a set of near field speakers but when we're listening through speakers in a room we're introducing a whole load of problems with the room which I'm going to come on to later. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go into the pros and cons of why we would use headphones when we're trying to monitor the bass. So in a standard room with a left and a right speaker what we're going to get is we're going to get cross feed. So what this means is when the left speaker it's not only going to play to the left ear but it's also going to reach the right ear and vice versa for the right speaker it's going to go to both ears. With headphones, because of the way the headphones shape around the ear, we don't get a cross feed. So what that means is we can't use headphones for any sort of stereo imaging because we're only going to get an extreme right or an extreme left. We're not going to get anything in between. The second issue we've got with headphones is how well they're going to be able to replicate the frequency spectrum. So as you can see here, we've got the frequency response graph of the Sennheiser HD25s compared to the AKG K81 DJ headphones. So I actually have a set of HD25s and I have used them occasionally for bass monitoring because as you can see they still hold up quite well at the low end. As for the AKG K81s, as you can see they start to dip at about 100Hz and although it is quite a natural dip, you are going to find yourself boosting the subs and bass to make up for the fact that your headphones can't replicate those low end frequencies. So just to show you that you do get what you pay for when it comes to things like headphones and studio monitors, what we've got here are the Sennheiser HD800s. They're quite expensive but as you can see they've got a very flat frequency response. If you look at the 2 to 5k range you can see it's actually got a bit of a prominent dip and that's because that's where our hearing is most sensitive to the human voice. So by actually dipping it slightly and then raising it afterwards what we're getting is a much more flat and true frequency response. Just for a little bit of a comparison I thought I'd throw in the frequency response graph of the Apple earbuds. So as you can see right the way up at about 110 hertz you're starting to get a roll off. So there's absolutely no way in a million years you could use these for any sort of bass monitoring. You'll find this with things like computers, TVs and docking stations. Anything below about 80 to 100 hertz aren't going to be reproduced properly whatsoever. So that's something we need to bear in mind when we're making bass heavy tracks, is that we need to think about how it's going to translate to different playback systems. And so the final bad point for headphones is that you've got to be careful of tinnitus, which is basically the ringing in the ears. That's basically hearing damage, which is eventually going to lead to hearing loss. So that's something you need to be aware of because it's very easy to crank it up in headphones. So now that I've covered all the bad points, you're probably thinking that headphones isn't a very good idea, but actually it can be really useful because the good thing about headphones is that what it actually does is it negates any of the problems with the room. Because what you're getting is you're getting the signal coming straight out of the headphones drivers and it's going straight into your ears. Whereas what you're getting when you're listening through your monitors is it's coming out of your monitors and before it reaches your ears, there's a whole load of factors that are going to contribute to changing the sound. This could be things from the way it's reflecting the surfaces in the room, the shape of your room, the listening position, the speaker position, room modes, reverberation, and all these factors are going to completely change the signal. So what I'd recommend is if you do have a really badly treated room and there's not much you can do about it, then use headphones as and when you need to. But if you can help it, get your room sorted, spend a bit of money on treating it, and use your near fields. So now that we've talked about some of the issues with near field monitors in the room, we're going to talk about how you can fix them. Okay, so firstly what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the monitors. So as you can see here, we've got a set of Yamaha HS8s, and another popular set of uh, monitors would be the KRK Rocket series. 
And what I've also got is I've got a performance chart to show you the frequency response of the different speakers. So you can get these monitors in a range of different sizes. And when we're talking about the size, it's referring to the diameter of the speaker cone. So as you can see in this graph, the HS8s have got quite a good low frequency response compared to some of the other speakers. So this would be quite a good choice for a decent sized room. So you wouldn't want to put these in a very small room because all it's going to do is it's going to project those bass frequencies out which are going to bounce all around your room and it's going to cause real bad issues with standing waves because you've got such a small room. As you can see we've also got the HSAS with a very unusual looking frequency response. That's because it's a subwoofer and that's to be used in combination. So when you're setting up a subwoofer what you do is you would bring the level so it matches that of your normal monitors. It's not there to add extra gain, it's just there to extend the low end. It's an extension of your frequency range and nothing more. So when you're doing that, things you need to be careful about are how loud you set it, the crossover frequency between your sub and your monitors, and also making sure it's phase aligned. So the location of it in your room matters because wherever it is, it's going to change the phase. So you can use some phase alignment software to make sure that's correct. So next what we've got is we've got different speaker designs. So here we've got a sealed and we've got a ported. So the problem we've got here with ported is that it can either be on the front or the port can be on the back. And if it's on the back, and especially if we've got our speakers in the corner of a room, it's going to project that sound out into the corner and then it's going to bounce back. And when it comes back to us, it's going to have a bit of a delay or a latency on it, which is going to cause some timing issues. Because you're basically going to get a second image of the sound reflected ever so slightly afterwards so it's going to give you a bit of a um, muffled bass sound. So the next thing we've got with sealed and ported designs is that it's a little bit of a trade-off for what we're after. So basically a sealed design is going to have a much more gentle dip when it gets to the frequency cutoff. So it gets to about 50-40 hertz it's just going to gently tail off until eventually it can't reproduce those frequencies. And that's fine it's going to be a bit more accurate but it's not going to have that low extension that we need whereas in a ported design the port has been specifically designed so it resonates around a certain frequency usually with these sort of near fields you're talking around sort of somewhere around the 40 hertz mark and what that's actually going to do is that's going to extend the bass slightly it's not going to be completely accurate because what it will do is it will extend the bass to say 35 40 hertz and then it will sharply slope off but what it is going to do is it is going to extend the bass right down to that level. So it's going to be slightly less accurate, but it is going to give you that amount of bass down to that level. And another thing to bear in mind is how the sound rings on. So what we've got here is we've got two speaker designs. On the left, we've got unported and on the right, we've got ported. And this is a waterfall diagram. So what that means is it's basically just a bog standard frequency spectrum, but over time. So as it comes towards you, this is how long in, uh, in time or in seconds the sound rings on. So as you can see with our ported design on the right hand side, it does resonate around the 40-50 hertz mark, which means it's going to ring out those notes a little bit longer. Uh, that's not necessarily a massively bad issue, but it's just something to be aware of. Now we're going to cover a few things about speaker orientation and placement. So the first thing is that speakers need to be set up in the way that they're designed to be set up. So what that means is people shouldn't be putting their speakers up sideways, which is happening quite a lot. So if your speaker's designed to be upright, it needs to be upright. And the reason for this is when you've got them on the speaker stands, if you've got them on sideways, what you're going to have is you're going to have the driver coming towards you. And if, you, if your speaker isn't directly facing you, then your tweeter is either going to be slightly forward or slightly back. So there's going to be phase alignment issues between your tweeter and your driver. Whereas if it's upright, and the tweeter should be at a round eye level and then they're hitting you at the exact same time. So as well as that, it goes without saying that your speakers should be equal distance apart from each other and equal distance from you. So you're in the optimal listening point. So to do that, you want to get them in an equilateral triangle sort of formation. You're talking about three feet away from you and three feet away from each other. And then what you can do is you can just slightly adjust the distance between the two speakers. And what you can do is see how that affects the stereo image. So if they're too wide, you're going to get a gap in the stereo image in the center. And if they're too narrow, then you're going to get a very narrow band of sound coming straight towards you without the stereo imaging. And also, you don't want the speakers facing the back wall. They need to be facing directly towards you in the optimal listening position. And also make sure you check the settings on the back of the speakers, because what you've usually got is you've got some sort of uh, low or high frequency damping. And you've also got the gain. So you want the gains to be the same and make sure the damping set for your room. So maybe one speaker might need to be slightly adjusted if it's right up in the corner. But ideally, you want those settings to be the same. 
Uh, you want the speakers to be in a position in the room where it's equal from the walls on both sides and you want your speakers projecting down the longest distance of your room because that's going to minimise problems with standing waves and room modes. So next we've got speaker stands. So with stands, if you're going to get some, try and get some decent, solid floor standing ones because that's going to minimise any sort of problems with vibrations or resonances. So if they're made of metal, they're likely to resonate or vibrate. So what you can do is fill them with sand and that sand is going to absorb any vibrations. And if you can help it, try not to put them on your desk for the same reasons because the speakers will make things on your desk vibrate and it's all just going to add to you not being able to hear the sound properly. And here what we've also got is we've got some Aurelex insulation pads and they go on the speaker stands for your speakers to go on top of or on your desk for your speakers to go on top of and that's just to decouple the speakers from the desk. And then what you can also get is the same things for your stand to the floor. So now we're going to take a look at room modes and standing waves. So we're going to need to use a little bit of maths and formulas for this next bit. So what we can do is we can use a little bit of this maths to figure out good dimensions for the room and also the best way to treat it. So the reason we have our speakers down the longest length of the room is to do with the bass frequencies and their wavelengths. So if we look at this formula, what we've got is we've got the speed of sound is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So what we can do is we can transpose that a bit. So it's the speed of sound over the frequency equals the wavelength. So this is speed in meters per second, frequency in hertz, and wavelength, which is lambda, which is Greek, but that's also measured in meters. So if we do this for, say, 50 hertz, what we can say is that the speed is 343 meters per second. So that never, that never changes. The speed of sound is always going to be 343 meters per second divided by the frequency of 50 hertz, and that's going to give us a wavelength of 6.86 meters. So if we have a look at this chart, we can see all the different frequencies and wavelengths going up to about 300 hertz, because that's when it starts to become less of an issue. And as you can see, at 300 hertz, we've got a wavelength of 1.1 meters. So within any given space, when a sound hits a surface, you're going to get a few different things. You're going to get reflection, absorption, and diffusion. So reflection is obviously when it bounces back, much like a mirror. Absorption is when it's going to get soaked into the material, which is like when something vibrates, it's taking energy out of it. And then with diffusion, it's when it's going to hit a surface and then it's going to spread out and bounce back in loads of different directions. And with things like plasterboard and hard stone walls and that, you're going to get quite a lot of reflection. So what you're going to get is say you've got a complex sound, say we've got something like a piano that's made up of loads of different frequencies. And when that piano sound comes out of your speakers, all these different frequencies are going to go across to one end of the room and they're going to hit the wall and they're going to reflect back. And certain frequencies are going to fit directly in between the space between your wall and your speakers. And if it fits exactly, when it bounces back from the wall, it's going to be directly out of phase. So in this diagram here, we can see we've got a sine wave, which we could say is one of the frequencies of our piano. And if this fits directly between the space in between two walls, then we're going to get either phase summing or phase cancellation. So it's going to make its way from one wall all the way across to the other side. And when it hits that second wall and bounces back, it's going to be directly out of phase, which is going to be an anti-node. And then at the crossover points, it's going to be nodes. So we can say at the anti-node, it's going to be directly out of phase. And what this means is we're not going to be able to hear the sound at that position. So if we move around our room, we're going to notice we're going to have louder bass areas and quieter bass areas. And you'll probably find that this usually manifests itself with much more bass in the corners of the room. So what we can actually do is we can use a formula to find out exactly where the troublesome frequencies are going to be in any given room. So the formula for this is frequency equals speed of sound over twice the distance. So the reason it's twice the distance is because obviously it's got to go from one wall and then back again. Okay, so the frequency of the resonance mode, we'll find this out for a hypothetical room will say it's going to be three meters in size. So what that's going to be is it's going to be 343 divided by twice the room. So two times three, six. So in this case, we're going to have a frequency of 28.5 hertz. So what this means is this is where we're going to have a room mode. And as well as having a, a room mode at 28.5 hertz, 
we're also going to have a room mode at double that frequency and half that frequency and so on. So we're also going to have issues at 56 hertz and about 112 hertz. And remember, this is only for one side of the room. So what we then got to do is take a measurement of the other distance of the room and also from the ceiling as well, and then do the same again. And what we'll do is we'll get ourselves a couple of sets of room modes for each dimension of the room. And this is the reason why perfectly square rooms aren't good rooms, because what you'll find is that the room modes add up exactly and you'll get the same room mode for each dimension of the room. And what that's going to do is it's going to have a cumulative effect. So you're going to have really, really bad issues at set frequencies. It's better to have a slightly odd shaped room or a room with slightly different dimensions. So the room modes aren't on exactly the same frequency. So what we can do to test this theory, if you load up a instance of analog, once you've figured out all of the room modes within your room, what you can do is you can generate a sine wave at whatever frequency you found that you've got room modes using the formula and then walk around your room and you'll notice that you'll get areas within your room where the sound pretty much completely drops out and then completely comes back in again. These are the nodes and the anti-nodes that we were talking about earlier. And what you also find is you're probably going to get quite a bit of bass build up in the corners of your room. So what we're going to do now is talk about how we can treat these issues. So a practical example of why we need to know about these nodes and anti-nodes. Say we're making a track and we're sat in our optimal listening position and we're going to make our track in the scale of G. So we're going to put our kick drum on G1, which is 49 hertz. Now, if our room is a certain dimension, 49 hertz in our listening position is going to either be a node or an anti-node, which means we're not going to hear it properly. So this means it's either going to be over or under accentuated. So we're going to dive in with an EQ on the fundamental frequency and we're either going to boost it like crazy or we're going to cut it like crazy. And then what we're going to do is then when we take that track, which sounds amazing in our room, to another studio or a different listening environment, it's going to sound like an absolute shambles because there was actually nothing wrong with it whatsoever. So out of the three things we said earlier, reflection, absorption and diffusion, our main issue really is going to be reflections, especially with the low end. So if you look at this diagram, you can see how the speakers are basically going to have early reflections that are going to bounce around the room before reaching our ears. The best sort of way to think of this is similar to how a water droplet lands in water and ripples out in all directions. Speakers are almost similar, but they don't exactly go out in all directions, but they do have set dispersion angles. So when the speaker's aimed at you, it is going to hit the wall behind you and even the walls to the sides of you, the ceiling and the floor. So when these sounds hit a surface, it works much the same as light or with anything hitting a mirror. And what we mean by that is the incident angle is going to hit the surface and then it's going to match the reflected angle. So what we can use is a mirror technique to decide where our various acoustic treatment is going to go. So all we've got to do is if we get someone to hold a mirror up against one of our walls and we move it along the wall, all you've got to do is look in the mirror and wait until you can see your speaker. And that is where you need to place acoustic treatment. And that'll be the same on the left hand side. And then obviously you need to do that with the area behind the speakers, which is probably one of the most important areas. And then also the area directly behind you as well. So there's a few different things you can use as far as acoustic treatment goes. The most common acoustic treatment is these foam panels here. And you can pick these up quite cheap, but they're not really going to do a great deal for the low end. They're only going to do the high mids and the high frequency damping. So what you can do is you can look at where you've used the mirror technique and place these on the side walls and the wall behind the speakers and then the wall directly behind you to try and dampen some of those frequencies. A word of warning with those though is that don't overdo it because you can actually be overzealous with this and you can make the room sound really unnatural by using too much of it. So don't go overboard. If you're finding that it does sound a bit odd, what you can do is replace the foam panels with diffusers. And what we've got here is a wooden diffuser which has been mathematically built so it spreads out the sound. So what you do is you put this on the back wall behind you and as the sound hits it, it's going to bounce off all the different surfaces and be diffused or dispersed throughout the room instead of being reflected directly back at you. So that's going to sound a little bit more natural than using foam panels. And as well as that, that's going to deal with a lot more frequencies as well. So to deal with these lower frequencies, what we need is thicker foam or more higher density foam. So just as a rule of thumb, with about four inch thick foam, that's going to dampen frequencies from about two to 300 hertz and above. And two inch thick foam is going to do about four to 600 hertz and above. So basically we need sort of eight inch plus thick foam to deal with the proper bassy frequencies, especially in the corners of the room. So what we can actually do to increase the depth of our acoustic treatment is to actually just leave a bit of an air gap. So when we're mounting it to the wall, 
if we use something to make sure we've got maybe a two or four inch gap, then what that's going to do is it's actually going to act pretty much as if it was, say, eight inch foam. And another method is to actually do it ourselves and go DIY. And what we can do is actually get some timber frames and some rock wool, which we can buy online in nice long slabs or rolls. And we can actually build our own because rock wool is quite high density and it's actually perfect uh, acoustically for soundproofing. So if you can see in these pictures here, you can place the rock wool inside the timber frames. Then what you do is you cover it with a material which isn't going to stop the sound getting through and to stop the fibres going everywhere from the rock wool. And then you mount these on the walls and that's going to give you your desired thickness rather than using the acoustic foam. And then finally, what we can also do is we can use the rock wheel to build ourselves some base traps or we can buy them pre-made just like we did with the Orenex foam. And as you can see in this picture, this is what they look like. So what these base traps do is the majority of the low frequency uh, base damping by putting these in the corners of the room what they're going to do is they're going to absorb all the low frequencies and stop you getting a base build up in the corners. And as for placement of this, you need to make sure not only are you placing them in the corners going vertical, but also in the ceiling to wall corners. And if you can, also the floor to wall corners, because you're going to get it from the top and bottom as well from the sides. So with that in mind, we also need to think about how we're going to stop issues from the ceiling. So a common method is to use something called a cloud which is basically exactly the same as before. It's just like a wall mount, like from the rock wall, but this time it's going to be hanging from the ceiling. So this is what they look like. And that's how we can stop that happening. Most people won't actually go that far, but if you do have the means and you want to, then you can look at setting up a cloud as well. The last thing I want to talk about is listening levels. So we need to know what is a sensible level for us to monitor back at. So what we've got here is a equal loudness curve or also known as the Fletcher Munson graph. So basically a long time ago, Fletcher and Munson researched into the equal loudness curves and they found that our ears aren't linear. Okay, so we've got heightened sensitivity in the three to five kilohertz range, which is the sort of human speech range. And it drastically slopes off towards the higher frequencies and it slowly tapers off as well towards the lower frequencies, as you can see in this graph. And what they found is that the 70 to 90 decibel range is where you're going to get the flattest response. So somewhere between there is where we should be ideally monitoring our mix. Any lower than that, and you're going to find the mid range seems louder and the bass and the high seem quieter. And any higher than that, and you find that the bass and the high end is going to sound a lot louder. So this little trick's used all the time to make tracks sound louder than they actually are, which is called the scooped mids. And what this basically means is we're going to push up the bass and the high end of a track and that means it's going to sound like we're listening to it at a higher level because it's going to get that effect psychoacoustically. So what we need to be aware of with this is that when we're monitoring, if we've got it turned up really, really loud, then it's going to sound a lot bassier and it's going to have a lot more high end than it actually does and then vice versa if we have it too quiet. So the optimum range to make sure we're getting a true representation is somewhere between 70 to 90 decibels. I'd recommend 85 and what you can do is you can check this using an SPL meter. So what this is going to do is it's going to measure the sound pressure level of your room to make sure you're monitoring at the right volume. Here you can see one that I've just downloaded onto the iPad and it's actually being checked and it is within plus or minus two decibels which is accurate enough for what we're trying to do. So what we can do is set this up in our room and then make sure we're monitoring around that sort of 80, 85 decibels mark. Uh, but if you don't want to do that then what you can do is just set it so that you can still hold a conversation over the music without having to raise your voice and that'll be roughly the right sort of level. And what some people also do is they'll set another reference level if you've got yourself a little uh, monitor controller. So then what you can do is you can switch between quiet and loud or dim and then your normal level. And that's just a good little way to check things because then you get two set references. As long as you always stick to those two reference levels, then you'll be absolutely fine. So the last thing I want to really quickly show you is reference tracks. So what we're going to do is just rename this reference. And I like to color code it white and drag it over to the left hand side. And what we're going to do is we're going to just drag a reference track in. As you can see, this is a .wav file, right? We shouldn't be using MP3s for referencing. So we we'll just drag that there and let that load. And some people like it just in session view, but I like to put it in a range view as well. And then there's a few little things we can do. If we go to the input output section, we need to make sure that the audio out goes to the external out. 
And the reason for that is that we don't want this reference track going through our master chain and getting processed as well, because then we're not going to be able to reference it properly. We're actually going to be referencing our master as well. So that's why it goes straight to the external out, while all of our stuff does go to the master, as you can see there. Um, and then what we also need to do is make sure we gain match it so we can do that just here. And using the metronome up here, we need to make sure this is in time. So I'm just going to quickly do that now by setting a few warp markers. Okay, so really quickly what I'm going to do is just get it in time. So what we can do is use our metronome here and just play it. So all we're trying to do here quickly is find the first beat and make sure the metronome is making sense with the first beat. So that's our first beat and then we just walk from there straight. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to reference this track against ours for things like stereo image, level, tonal balance and frequency spectrum, as well as other things like the arrangement and different instruments used throughout. So when it comes to referencing the frequency spectrum or the tonal balance of the track, then I'd recommend using Voxenjo Span, which is a free spectrum analyzer plugin, which is absolutely brilliant. And if you look at the functions here, we can go into the low frequency inspection mode and this is going to give us a much better idea of what's going on in the low end and as well as that it's also got a phase correlation meter and this gives us a decent idea of what key this track is in. So that's Foxenjo for frequency analysis. As you can see here, we've also got the crest factors, we've got the RMS, and we've also got whether it's clipping or not. And as I mentioned earlier, we've also got this phase correlation meter, which I'll be going into a little bit more detail later on. What we've also got is we've got the isotope ozone imager. Uh, there's loads of free plugins you can use for this, but what I'm on about here is the vector scope. And like you just seen on the last plugin is the correlation meter, which is the same thing we've got here. So if you listen, so as you can see, we've got the polar samples here, and what this is doing is this is showing us the stereo imaging between the left and the right channel. So if we drop a utility plugin on, what we can do is we can reduce this to mono, and you can see we just get one single line. And if we push this all the way up to stereo, then we'll see it's going to be a horizontal line. And we can see the phase correlation meter match that as well. So there's three different modes, there's polar sample, polar level, and deciduous. So I'd recommend keeping that in polar sample mode, but that's what we can use to reference that as well. And finally, the last trick I wanted to uh, show you for referencing is simply grabbing a filter. So you can do this with an EQ, you can do it with a filter, it doesn't really matter. We'll do it with auto filter. And I'm just going to play the track. And this is a really good technique to hear what's going on in that low end. As you can hear, you are getting um, fundamentals and harmonics from other instruments and bits of reverb and whatever else is going on. This is a good little way of deconstructing how a track's made by splitting up the frequency bands so we can see just what elements go into each part. And then we can find out how to make basses like this. So we can hear there all we've really got going on is the kick drum. We haven't got a great deal more. We're starting to get bass come through about 200 hertz. So in this case, it's predominantly the kick drum that's taking up this sub frequency. So we can hear that this bass isn't very present below about 100 hertz, especially in the breakdown. And the kick does have a lot more presence in that area. So I know this session's been a little bit soul destroying and I've just been belt feeding theory, but all of this information is important for the rest of the course. It's important that you get your room and your monitors correct 
before we start moving on to other parts because there's no point trying to figure out what's wrong with your bass or what you need to do or why it doesn't sound right in the mix if you can't hear it properly.